Let's restore an NES. The Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES for short, was released in North America in February 1986. By the end of its run, it had an impressive library of 716 licensed games, with some of those games continuing on to be a series still enjoyed today. This particular NES looks like it's seen every bit of those last 36 years. It's dirty, it's yellowed, the cartridge slot is broken and it isn't sticking down, and worst of all, we have the blinking red light of death. Now I did try holding the cartridge down and it had the exact same effect. These systems are really easy to get into, all you need is a Phillips head screwdriver. These were made before Nintendo got into security bits and things like that. With six screws removed, everything comes apart. The inside of the system was dusty and had a little bit of rust, but overall it wasn't too bad. And it looks like this might not actually be broken, just extremely dirty, so we're gonna clean that out and see what happens. The inside of the system uses the exact same screws that the outside shell had. Earlier I said you can use a Phillips head screwdriver, which is still correct, however, properly these are JIS bolts or Japanese industrial standard. If you only have Phillips head screwdrivers, I suggest one with a flatter tip. Now that it's all disassembled, I'm going to pull off the 72 pin connector. A very common cause of the blinking red light of death is a bad connector, however, this NES also has a bulged capacitor here. So we're just going to recap the whole thing. I'm going to readjust the pins in the 72 pin connector. Over years of use and games being inserted and pulled out, these pins eventually get pushed down and will no longer read games. Once I had realigned all the pins, I used 99% alcohol on a toothbrush and I scrubbed them all down just to clean it up. Now before doing all this, I did boil this connector for 15 minutes in water. Unfortunately not thinking at the time, I forgot to film it, however as strange as it sounds, it actually works. I'm not sure why the boiling technique works. Maybe it just kind of softens the plastic and reforms it. I'm not too sure. Now there's plenty of YouTube videos of people doing it and they might even explain why it works. So I really encourage you to go check that out and learn from them as well. Now, all that being said, you'll see a lot of people use third-party connectors, which I've done in the past myself if I can't fix the original connector. The original connectors just have a better quality and they last way longer. So I really try to avoid using them if I can. Usually these connectors are so resilient and tough, you just need to boil them, bend them and clean them and they're good to go. While I had the alcohol and toothbrush out, I cleaned this and now it's working perfectly fine. To replace the capacitors inside the power box, we're gonna have to remove it from the main board. This is definitely the biggest chore when doing this. And I've yet to do this without accidentally setting off the smoke detector. Some folks have suggested to me to pull back the top lid on the power box here and just replace the capacitors while it's still attached to the board. However, I'm always worried I'm going to damage something if I do it that way. Right now, I remove these by using my soldering iron, some flux, a solder sucker, some solder wick, and then my hot air gun to fully take it off. If you know of a better way, please tell me in the comments so I can do this a lot easier in the future. Yes. With this off the board, I'm able to pop open the top lid here and easily access all of the capacitors underneath. I have one of my capacitor kits to replace all the capacitors and the voltage regulator. I started by cleaning any dirt and grime that was on the bottom of the board here with isopropyl alcohol, and then I started taking off the solder around the capacitors and the voltage regulator. With the solder removed, it's easy to pull out these components one by one. If you end up doing one of these yourself and you haven't done one before or you don't have access to a schematic, I suggest replacing these one by one. And what I mean by that is that there's a whole bunch of capacitors in here with different values. If you take them all out at once, it's a little difficult trying to figure out which one goes where. However, if you remove one 10 microfarad and then you replace it with another 10 microfarad and move to the next one, you'll never get confused and they'll always be correct. And here's our bulged capacitor. Now I don't exactly think this is what was causing that blinking light of death, but it's good to replace it anyhow. There's a little bit of corrosion here on the board from it leaking, so we're gonna clean that up with isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. Now because that capacitor had leaked, I removed all the other capacitors so I could properly clean the board. I just followed a schematic that I found online to replace the capacitors in their appropriate positions. With all of those pushed through, I soldered each individual leg and then trimmed off the excess. With that done, I'm gonna replace the three capacitors on the main board. With those done, we're ready to go. This reminds me of Star Wars. Oh good, I can't maneuver. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. Uh, let's disable the lockout chip. This chip is just above these two capacitors here, and we'll be removing the fourth pin from the left here on the bottom. Removing this pin will deactivate the lockout chip, which will allow you to play bootleg games, and it will occasionally stop the blinking light of death. Now I've done a few videos on repairing an NES and the blinking light of death, and I always get comments saying that if I just remove the lockout chip, I'll fix it. That's incorrect. 
Now there definitely is times where the system will read the game, however it's just not reading it well enough, and then it will throw that error code, and deactivating this will rectify that problem. However, that doesn't always happen. Now I truly believe that the correct way to fix the blinking light of death here is to clean it and bend those pins back or just replace it if you can't fix it. I accidentally botched this one because you're not really supposed to remove the pin from the chip itself, you're just supposed to break it, however it still works, I lucked out. Whew. I would have just had to replace the chip, I'm glad that I didn't have to though. With the board ready to go, I soldered the power box back on. As I was cleaning it, I realized that I missed this little metal part that goes onto the voltage regulator, so I just threw that on as well. And now, the moment of truth. Nothing. Because we deactivated the lockout chip, it's not going to blink anymore, but we still don't have any output. Now I took a look at these, and they're pretty dirty, so I'm going to try cleaning them up to see what happens. And don't worry, I'm getting to that voltage regulator. That's pretty good, however, there's no audio. Now this can be a few things which has me kind of worried, however, I'm going to try it with the RF cable here first to see what happens. Perfect, that isolates my problem a little bit more. Now I still believed it was the port, so I used a fine grit sandpaper just to clean them up a little more, and they were pretty dirty. And it still didn't work. Now I was getting worried that I was going to have to troubleshoot for a few more hours, but then I decided to try something really, really simple just in case. Now these were my personal tester cables, which I used to diagnose multiple systems. It just happened to be a fluke that they stopped working on this system. Now that the NES is fully operational, we're going to work on cleaning it. This system had years of dirt and grime packed into it, so using soap and water and a brush I was able to clean it up just a bit, and it's looking a little better, however it's still discolored. A lot of older devices use bromine in their plastic as a fire retardant. Now, over time UV light will interact with that bromine and it causes that yellowing that you see on a lot of older systems. To reverse this, we're going to use a process called retrobrighting. Basically, you submerge your system in hydrogen peroxide and expose it back to UV light and it reverses that yellowing. While it's retrobrighting, I'm going to work on the controllers. Now the controllers function fine, however they're dirty and they're yellowed, so we're going to throw them into a retrobriting tank. I inspected the conductive pads to ensure that there was no tearing, and I saw that the start and select button just had some pieces chewed out of them, so I'm going to replace those. With the controllers cleaned and retrobrighted, I put everything back in, and then I put those new silicone conductive pads in. Once I completely reassembled the controller, I tested it and found that everything's in working order. So the last thing to do is to clean the cord, and if you haven't done this to your controllers, I highly recommend you do, I just use a simple baby wipe and look at the dirt that comes off of this thing. Delicious. I reassembled the NES and I tested it, and I found an issue that I've seen a few times before, where it doesn't work in the down position, but it works in the up position. And I've had the opposite of this happen as well, where it doesn't work in the up position, but it works in the down position. And I've had it work in both positions. If you know of a fix for this, please let me know in the comments. This NES came to me dirtied, yellowed, and not functioning with some controllers that needed a little bit of TLC. It's leaving here working, fully recapped, and cleaned. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to completely retrobrite it, however, it's looking way better than when it arrived. The last thing to do is just extensively test it by playing one of my favorite games, The Legend of Zelda. Cleaned, repaired, restored. Let's save the consoles. Just a quick disclaimer. I have no formal training in any of this. I'm mostly self-taught. I've had a lot of help from people online helping me out, as well as doing my own research and looking at forums, videos, etc. So I really encourage you to learn with me, but please don't imitate me without doing your own research first. Just a quick disclaimer. I have no formal training in any of this. I'm mostly self-taught. I've had a lot of help from people online helping me out, as well as doing my own research and looking at forums, videos, etc. So I really encourage you to learn with me, but please don't imitate me without doing your own research first. Because if I make a mistake, I don't want you to make the same mistake. Now, if you saw me do anything wrong, please leave a comment down below so I can learn from it and so everybody else can learn from it. And we can all keep growing in this huge community.